Are you looking for a plant that does well in massed plantings while providing months of colours? Low maintenance flower carpet roses, planted three feet apart, work nicely as a garden bed border along driveways and on slopes. For more information, visit flowercarpet.com. Hello and welcome to another episode of Let's Argue About Plants, the podcast for people who love plants and don't love being in quarantine. I'm Danielle Sherry. I'm the senior editor at Fine Gardening Magazine. And I'm Steve Aiken, who would like Danielle to speak for herself. I love being in quarantine. I don't have to leave the house or talk to other people. I think that's great. <laughs> no, but you are talking to other people because we are yet again doing an episode in self-isolation from home of the podcast. Do you like and talk... You- you like talking to me, right? Well, you know, do I really talk to you or do I just wait for it's my turn to, to, to talk and then just prattle on for a few minutes and then stop again? Or do you just talk at me? That's what I thought you were going to say. There's probably, there's probably, you know, elements of both in it. <laughs> well, all right. So topic today is. And so best... anyway, Daniel, what I want to. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. You're speaking. Yeah. All right. So topic today is best plants for massing. And, and I, th- I think you have a strict definition of massing. Let's hear it. Okay. So my thing with massing is it's not about the number of plants. Okay. So we're talking about groupings of plants. I would say it's more than one plant, possibly more than two plants, but I feel like it could be three or more plants. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so so I'm doing exactly what I said I wasn't going to do. So it's three or more plants, but visually it looks like a large swath visually. That is so, my definition of a mass. So it could so be only three. It has to look like a swath. You yes. could have a three a three plant swath. Yes. Yes, you when, definitely could. And how would three plants plants look like a swath? Uh, like three plants planted close together, but they're very like wide reaching plants. Um, I have a few on my list today that look like a mass of plants, but it's literally only three plants. Okay. <laughs> and what is your definition of a mass? Um, it It's, it's not about numbers. It's, it's like you said, it's about the look, you mm-hmm. know, does it does it look like wow there's a whole bunch of those things you know okay um, and if if three plants um can get big enough that they they are impressive enough in stature you know um i think that could work you know what about two plants now you can't have a two plant it's just two plants okay so it, so we're 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 it, getting it, there three plants or more well right like you one plant can't be a mass it's one plant yeah. And two yeah. plants was just another one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So three or more but, plants but that one, make a one, visual statement. One person alone, you know, mm-hmm. is, is quarantine. You know, two people, you know. And then with once you get the third person, then you can officially say it's a party. You know? Oh, okay. Right? Like All now right. you're now you're now you're getting into entertainment status. Like, oh, it's a a group of us are hanging out, you know, and like yes. a fourth person, a fifth person. Now it's definitely a party, you know, but once you get down to two people, two people can't be a party. <laughs> that's just a, or, or even a, a get together, that's a date. you know, that's it's, a it's date. A, yeah, it's not even a get together. No, you know? it, it might like, be a hangout. It might be a hangout, you know, but it's, it's, okay. it's not, a, it's not a get together. Okay. So, All so right. that's, that's my, uh, that's my definition of, of massing. That's so good because I thought that you were going to say five or more because when I was looking online, a lot of garden designers, they actually define it as five or more plants. Yeah. You know, normally three, I would say, is like a grouping and then Mm -hmm. four is still a grouping. And then like once you get into five, it's then at that point, it's getting impressive enough to be a mass, you know, but you could could have some really big plants that you can get away with three and have it look like a mass. Exactly. It kind of depends on the plants. Now, what does it take to be a good plant for massing for you? You know, for me, it was what I chose was something that does bulk up 
bulks up nicely, blends nicely, plays nicely with its neighbors. You know, we're not talking something that's going to eat the entire garden if given, you know, the chance because you're putting several of them in. So you don't want something that's just going to take over. Um, I also think that it's something that is like a, a weaver plant, if you will, something that connects maybe, you know, two specimen plants, a really cool tree, and another focal point. Um, I feel like it's the connectors between the focal point plants. That's so what. what I went with, see, again, I was just waiting for you to finish so I could tell you what, what I thought. Uh, or and what you I didn't listen to a thing I said, did you? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Did you? Okay. Uh, no, I, I went with, uh, you, I didn't go with plants that bulk up so much. Uh, and in fact, I just looked at my list and, and uh, everything's kind of small on it. But I think okay. I think pretty much any plant works as um, something that is good for massing, it, unless it's too good looking, it's too garish, you know, it's too strong. Because then, if you plant a whole bunch of it, it gets to be too much. Okay. And or if it's too boring, where if you plant five or seven or eight of them, it's still boring. But think wait, of a plain wait, I... green hospital. But it is I, technically it's technically a mass, but it's not a good plant for massing. Okay. But also I think that there's certain plants that are just so cool that they should be focal points. I think right. certain plants should be just focal points. Okay, so for instance, you had um Pinus mini twists. You know, it's a really, really choice conifer, dwarf conifer, awesome texture. I feel like that's a focal point plant. That wouldn't be something that I would want to do five of because then I think it loses its oomph. But it's it's not it's not that garish. It's not over the top. Uh, imagine no. imagine again a party. Parties are great. Everybody loves parties. You don't. And we, and we well, you know, people love parties. <laughs> and you go to a party on Saturday, and that was awesome. And then you go to a party on Sunday and that's great. And then you go to a party on Monday and you're like, okay, that, that's enough. Can't we, I, I need to sit at home and, and watch a, you know, watch a mystery or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just too much of a good thing. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so certain did, I, per- did, did my camera just shake? Cause I just whacked the table that I, I was on. That's okay. That's- I, I, I- it's all part of the fun. I spilled yes. an entire glass of water once. So, you know, we'll just keep rolling with it. <laughs> did, did we edit that out? We edited that out. I don't know if we did. But the thing Maybe about we that is we weren't even in quarantine at that time. That was just in the regular studio and you just were <laughs> flopped off with the with the with the water everywhere. And... I talk with my hands a lot. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now that we've somewhat defined what a mass is, what plants are good for massing, you have some choice selections. Now I want to know if the, these are pl- You don't? Well, I mean, I do, but I want to know if your plants are actually the plants that are on your list or ones that you actually have used as massing in your garden, because I don't have enough massing in my garden. So I pick some things that I actually have in my garden and some things that I am I'm planning on doing this year because I think they're they're worthy. Uh, I well, well should, do you want to go plant by plant or do you want the overall yeah. answer right now? OK, yeah, so well, well. Just give me the overall answer first and then give me your first plant. Well, it's a little of all of that. Mm -hmm. Some of these I have masked in my garden. Uh, Some I have in my garden but are not masked. Uh, Some I have seen masked but are not in my garden. (laughs) Okay. All right. So what one are you going to start off with first? Uh, I'm going to go with old-fashioned ladies mantle, Mm -hmm. which um, uh, some people might be boring if they're looking for a crazy cultivar. But as far as um, just a good... um, uh, there's really nothing wrong with this plant. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, ladies mantle, Alcamella mollis, zones four to seven. Um, and so its foliage is like these round scalloped edge. Um, they're big round, maybe like six inches wide, scalloped edged foliage that looks cool, a little wavy. Uh, when the water gets on it, it beads up like a lotus leaf, mm-hmm. you know, really you know like, like mer- mercury does, like it does that. So it's got it's got that going for it. Um, and it, and it spreads out wonderfully, maybe about two feet, you know, per plant. Um, and then, you know, in, in early summer, it gets like these big fluffy, um, you know, chartreuse to yellow, uh, flowers that, uh, that go all over the place. And it looks, it looks amazing in a mass. Um, it, that's where it really has an impact and especially along an edge. Um, 
it does. There's there's something very English garden about it. Uh, yeah. Maybe even the name, just ladies mantle. I mean, I feel like like um, you know English people wear wear mantles. Um, women over here would wear scarves. Uh, but it's just it's just uh, it, it looks amazing when you plant five or seven or eight together when you have it in a big sweep, you know, along the front of a border. It just looks super cool. Um, it reseeds and it's easy to divide, so you can make your own mass. You don't have to buy fifteen you know, right out the gate. So you can you can work up to that. Um, mm -hmm. amazingly easy to grow, partial shade, uh, reseeds around a little bit, um, just a great, great plant. And it's just, sometimes you need some no brainers, especially for massing. Like you want them to take up yeah. a lot of room. And this is a plant you don't have to think a lot about. Um, uh, there's not a lot of maintenance involved, um, uh, you know, in, you know, February, or March, like I rake out the dead foliage, you know, and it rakes right out and the new foliage grows over whatever is left, um, very easy to grow, looks cool, uh, great flowers, great foliage. That's all you need. And not too showy. Showy enough to no. make you go, ooh, but, but not so much that it's going to be in your face. And yeah. even when it's not blooming, it still looks cool, but it's not boring. So, so it checks off all my boxes for a massing plant. I really like I and enjoy the flowers. You know, over the years, I feel like that gets described as a foliage plant over and over again because the foliage is stunning. It's really, really cool. But the flowers really get shortchanged on it. They're really like these pillowy blooms of uh, like almost like yellow cotton candy. I love it. And yeah, uh, it makes a great cut flower too, which is awesome. Yeah, the word I was going to use is frothy. So somewhere between Very frothy, frothy, yeah, like, yeah, there's, there's something about those, those flowers that's amazing. And especially when you see them like in a big, like I said, like going around a corner, um, mm -hmm. it just, it just looks super cool. That would be the first plant that would come to mind if somebody said, I want a plant to soften the edges. I would think of that plant mm -hmm. because it really does soften the edges. So that's a good sure. one. I like that yeah. one. Um, so one, I went one, one point for me. What? Well, we'll give I you a, a point. Like mm -hmm. let's, you know, come on. We're going to keep it in check here. So, all right. So this round, I'm going to go with a plant that um, we've talked about it before. We get sent samples a lot. And, you know, some samples are good, some samples not so much. But these, a, a few years ago, we were sent a lot of the, um, I think they're the bushel and berry uh, dwarf uh, blueberries. There was a lot of different blueberries that they were coming out with that were these dwarf version of blueberries. And um, there was one in particular that was called jelly bean. And uh, I think I ended up taking home three of these and I put them, you know, kind of in my vegetable garden along the edges and, you know, things just happen. I redid my beds and I moved these three dwarf blueberries into one of my large ornamental beds. And uh, like two years ago, I looked over and I said, man, I was driving up the driveway. Like, what is that really good looking plant? Really, really small. It's only about two feet tall by two feet wide. And I inadvertently planted them kind of in a grouping and they had massed out and they looked like, like shiny kind of like neon green boxwoods, which was really pretty. And then I watched them through the year, the rest of that year. And they got this amazing burgundy color um, later on in fall. And I, I assume that they got some fruit that year. I don't know. But then the next spring, I really paid attention and they got beautiful little, you know, pendulous white flowers on them that kind of have a dark pink bract. And I noticed that the stems are really, really pink too. And now it's like one of my favorite plants and I'm going to get a couple more and do another mass of them a little bit further down in that bed because, man, who would have thought a dwarf blueberry that that would be a good massing plant? Zones four to eight, partial shade to full sun. I've got it in really, really lean soil, um, which is kind of surprising because they tend to like a little bit more moisture. But this thing is a rocking plant and I didn't really have much hope for it or, you know, I didn't have a lot invested in it. Now, this is certainly not a blueberry plant that you're going to plant to harvest gobs and gobs of blueberries for because it gets these teeny tiny, flavorful, but teeny tiny little berries, nothing, nothing very significant. So yeah, I kind of love it. Um, yeah. So I think I said one and a half to two feet tall and wide. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect. Love it. Why not, why not just grow low bush blueberry? You know, just because I got them for free. <laughs> so 
that a good answer? So, so, so a low bush, a low bush blueberry would do the same thing. It, it probably yeah. would, but low bush, bush blueberry, um, I think doesn't have the same because uh, I have some native low bush b- blueberry on my property in the wooded area, and it doesn't have as shiny a leaf, um, and the leaves are a little bit bigger. Um, there's just something about the texture of this jelly bean variety that's just really, really eye catching. And, um, yeah, I, I kind of love it. Kind of love it, but I love boxwood. So there you go. Well, I've, I have low bush blueberry that, that, um, and it spreads on its own, which is Mm. good. Um, and uh, you, you don't get the big berries off of it, but you do mm-hmm. get you get small berries, which um, you know I find are much more flavorful they than are, the really yeah. big ones. Um, but uh, it's it's a lot harder to harvest all the teeny tiny little ones than it is to <laughs> harvest a few of the big bigger ones. Um, so uh, I w- I would say uh, low bush blueberry is also good for those who either can't find or can't afford the name brand. Uh, the generic <laughs> variety is uh, is just as good. The jelly bean. I should have actually said that the cultivar name on this is actually some crazy thing. It's Z F O six dash blah blah blah. But yeah, it's it's jelly bean trademarked. Why would you why would you say that? Like like no one no one cares. I know, that, I know. That, and that's why they do that to the cultivar name. So no one cares. So you have to call so no it one jelly cares. bean. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, little a little mass of jelly bean uh blueberries is is bringing me a lot of joy right now in my front bed. So, uh, good. My next plant I'm going to toss out is a native plant, uh, native to Eastern North America in the shade. So nice. a great plant, a great plant for massing in shade. Cause it's, it's hard to find plants that work in shade. When you, when you do find one, you want to repeat it. So that's not a hosta, you know, not that's a hosta. Not a, that's, that's, that's yeah. everybody's go-to, right? Right. Um, so the the plant I think looks great in a mass, and I don't grow this, but I have seen it, and we actually have pictures of it. So Danielle, you can grab them and put them on the website. Uh, is northern maidenhair fern, mm, which yeah. is uh, Adiantum pedatum, zones three to eight. So you can grow this all the way up to wherever zone three goes, uh, and it gets it gets to be about two and a half feet tall, about one and a half feet wide, um, and it's just it's it's like all maidenhair ferns. It's very delicate looking. Uh, plant and so it has these 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 fronds where you know normally um, fern fronds you know the whatever the little guys who stick out from the sides you know along the fronds Mm -hmm. whatever those guys are they're long at the at the at towards the base and then they narrow in sort of like a triangle Mm -hmm. these guys stay pretty much the same length until you get to the very end so they have like this straight out uh, (laughs) vibe to them you know yeah this vibe no, still, still straight. Um, and then, and then they they sort of they, they come out in like a semicircle, and so they create this really cool shape of really delicate foliage. It looks it looks exactly like this, um, and just just an amazing plant. And because it's so delicate, you can plant a whole bunch of them without it being overwhelming. Um, okay. But there's still an, enough intricacy going on um, that it, that it attracts your attention. Um, just a, a great plant, uh, partial to full shade. Um, it's it's gonna need it moist. Okay, um, I don't think it can go into dry shade, um, even if it's well established. Um, do not let it dry out, is what everyone says. Um, I have grown it and let it dry it out, and that's why I don't have it anymore. Uh, but just a, a wonderful plant for for massing in the shade. Uh, really, any fern. Anytime I've seen any ferns in mass, it's really impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I chose this one, Northern Maidenhair fern, because it's um, it's one that I really want to grow. Um, I think it's amazing looking, and we have a picture of it. And you like that. (laughs) I love it when we have pictures of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I did. I pulled some of those down off of our our plant database, those photos. And man, you know, if a picture could make you want to like reach out and like pet a plant, that's what this looked like. I mean, the texture on maidenhair fern is just so awesome. It's like soft and just yeah, you just want to hug it or I don't know, ruffle its feathers or something. It's it's a really, really cool texture. Yeah, the, the Himalayan maidenhair fern is even has an even better texture to it. Yeah, uh, but it's it's not native, um, and I I think it, that's a little harder to grow because uh, mm-hmm. I killed that one too. Um, uh, that one definitely needs it moist. Like if you know if there's if there's a day that it's it's dry that it just curls up and looks like heck. Um, so yeah, but I go with the northern maidenhair fern. Favorite favorite that's- the native. 
It's a good choice. It's a good yeah. choice. I like it. I like so two, it. two points for me. Great. No, no, you're up to a point. You get a half a point for each decent plant. So you, you're up to one point. Let's not, you know, no gold stars yet. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> All right. So this is a plant that I purchased because we had a plant sale last year. And it wasn't actually, actually, I don't think I purchased it. I think it was something that was left over. And you knew that I was designing a garden for a friend of mine and said, hey, you know, take whatever's left over here. And I thought, meh. All right, these could work as a mass because I needed a mass in a specific area. And it was yellow wonder alpine strawberry, um, Frigeria vesca, yellow wonder. And uh, I love alpine strawberries for massing. I have regular red alpine strawberries in a section of my garden that I massed out. But this yellow wonder was awesome. So I planted it for her last year. It was in the beginning of the spring, this friend of mine. I think there were five of them total. Spaced them out a little bit because they only get eight to 10 inches tall and wide. Um, Eventually, they do spread out to 14 or so inches, allegedly. Um, But this is not the strawberries that you're used to where they have eight million runners and they spread all over creation. Alpine strawberries stay in a nice, neat little clump. And just this really, really beautiful kind of palmate dissected leaf that's got a, a little jagged serrated edge to it bright Kelly green has those really, really iconic white uh, flowers with the yellow center that you're used to with strawberries. And then it gets these little yellow, super flavorful yellow strawberries. Um, Her kids loved it. And from afar, it just made these kind of undulating, um, an undulating mass on the edge of the garden. Um, I really, really loved it. Um, I'm going to get more so I can repeat it in another section of her garden. And um, I actually liked it. The look of the plant was a little more compact than the straight species that I have in my garden. And um, and I only have, I think, two or three in, in my garden of the straight species. So Clearly, I need to get more, and I think I'm going to get the yellow wonder instead. Um, this is full sun, um, usually fertile, moist, well-drained soil for strawberries, but they're they're pretty forgiving. Um, she wasn't the best waterer last year, and uh, they're coming back in force. She sent me some photos this this spring. So, yeah, so yellow wonder, alpine strawberry, kind of unexpected. Do the um, do the chipmunks eat the strawberries? I don't, uh, at my house. Anyway, because that's, that was my thing with when I grew alpine strawberries is like, oh, oh I, can't, I, I can't wait for this to turn ripe. And then I would go back out two days later and it'd be gone. <laughs> I, I'm assuming chipmunks, squirrels, some other. Probably, rodent. probably. Yeah. I mean, with mine, I, you know, again, an alpine strawberry isn't like a normal strawberry plant. You're not going to be harvesting a whole ton. So if I'm out there weeding and I get a few berries, I'm happy, you know, It's not something that I guess I would notice if the chipmunks stole some here or there. Do they, do they spread by runners like normal strawberries to, to form like colonies? No, no, they don't. They kind of, um, they mass out a little bit and then you end up with like almost these little baby plants off of it, not off of runners though. So almost like little plantlets kind of on the side. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you would describe that, you know, a plant that eventually cleaves into a couple of other plants, almost like a heuchera does. Um, but yeah, they don't, they don't run because yeah, yeah, I, I've had bad experiences with, with regular strawberries before trying to incorporate those into areas and they're just everywhere. More, better behaved, if you will. All right. Uh, So I talked about shade. I want to get back into the sun for a minute. Uh, We could plant for, for massing in the sun. And again, this is another short one. I don't know why all the plants I, I selected were, were short. Um, hmm. I think it, it's easy to do massing with, with big plants. Um, and those I, I, can, I find a little overbearing. So I don't know. I think I went with all the, the short ones. Hmm. Um, but this one, this one is really short. Uh, it's called Wee One, Wee One Lavender. So it's, it. a, it's a dwarf lavender, uh, Lavendula angustifolia Wee One. Mm-hmm. Uh, zones five to nine uh, on this. Um, and it's, it's exactly that. It is a dwarf lavender that gets mi- under a foot tall. 
like eight to 10 inches, I think is, is where it's going to max out. Um, and it gets, it gets wider than that. Like maybe like a foot wide. So you get all the wonderfulness of a lavender, but in a small package. So it's easy to, I, I, I grow one of them. I got one as a mm-hmm. sample um, and it was tiny and I brought it home from Denver on a plane um, and planted it. And it's just four years now. And it's really bulked up, you know, really fast. Uh, and it's just, it's just a delightful plant. It has that, the wonderful foliage to it. You know, it has a wonderful texture to it. Everyone knows the lavender blooms, which I consider to be purple. I think lavender is just, you know, a $5 word for purple. Um, lavender is a light purple. It's very specific. It's, it's, it's purple. But like, oh if you want to, if, if you want to sound fancy, you say that that's, that's lavender, you know, <laughs> but you can just say purple, right? No, not right. There's yeah, many different no, shades right. in the purple range. Okay. All right. But but they're all purple. Uh, all right. So, we're, so we're not going to well, argue well, color if, theory with you. <laughs> if if you say, um, if uh, oh, that's, that's a lovely um, purple shirt. Or is it nicer to say, oh, what a lavender, what, what a lovely lavender blouse you have. Oh, yeah, definitely the latter. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that just sounds nicer, but it's the same thing. It's still a purple shirt. No, lavender and purple are not the same. They're not. They're pretty much. So what color is the Minnesota Vikings uniform? Purple. And what color is... Um, there are no I, I, of lavender. There are none. <laughs> there are none. I, I was trying, but I, I fell down on the, on the one yard line on that analogy. God no, damn it. La, you know, <laughs> lav- lavender is a paler purple. I, I get yes, it. But it it's, is. Basically, it is. it's still, it's still just purple. All right. Okay. All right. So back to we one, cause it is a back to we one. Uh, yes. Wonderfully fragrant, uh, wonderful lavender blooms, uh, on it. Um, smells great. Does all the things that you want, uh, in a lavender, uh, but in, in a much tighter, much more compact, a habit. So I've had lavenders that kind of spread open after a while. This hasn't happened. They get a little leggy. That hasn't happened. Um, it's just a wonderful small thing uh, for making in, an impact in a smaller space. Now, mm-hmm. if, if you've ever seen a mass of lavender, it's, uh, gorgeous. You, 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 it's gorgeous. If you see like the lavender fields out in California, it's just amazing and it's breathtaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it can also be a little much because lavenders can get pretty big. Yeah. And, but not with this one. So it, this is a great one. I wish I, I have one. I wish I had, you know, like six or seven more. Hint, hint, David Salmon from High Country Gardens <laughs> who introduced it. Um, because it, it's just a great plant. And I would love to just, add, you know, mask the, the front of, of the border that it's in with, with this plant. Uh, super low care. I've given it zero care. I may have, I may have, if I was smart when I planted it, planted it with some gravel for better drainage. Okay. Because that's the big problem for us, you know, out in the east growing a lavender. It's a Mediterranean mm-hmm. plant, you know, wants that wants that sharp drainage. So I probably planted it with some gravel because I was smart that day. But other than that, I've done I've done nothing. And then you you know, you trim off the blooms after they're done and that's it. You know, just a just a great plant. When I've grown lavender in the past, you know, the standard, you know, Monkstead or hit coat lavenders, the thing that I can't get over is just over three to four years, they just get so woody. And it really, it's, I, I feel like you really definitely need to have a PhD to prune a lavender correctly. So I would assume with these dwarf, the, you know, especially we one, but these ultra dwarf lavenders are coming out with less pruning, no pruning. Have you done I, I, any? I, I would say less to none because the okay. woodiness is so much less. Like you don't have to deal with that legginess, you know, okay. or that or that that separating, you know, the yeah, center, yeah, yeah. you know, and then it like, splits. Yeah, yeah like I, I have not had that problem yet, and it might, you know, as as it gets older, but it's going to mm-hmm. be on such a smaller scale. It's not going to be, you know, like like a two or three foot plant that's just you know falling apart. So it looks like you know a cracked globe or something like that. It's just going to yeah. be like, oh look, there's a little slice in it. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. I should grow more lavenders just because you know I'm on a hilly hillside area. Most of my gardens have really lean, well drained soil. I mean, it's the ideal plant for me. But I've always shied away from them because the couple times that I've grown them, they've done that. They've done the lavender split where it's you know they get gangly woody 
split open. You're trying to prune it back. You prune too far. It doesn't come back. It kills the plant. It's just a nightmare. So yeah, I'm hint, hint, David Salmon. I would like some too. <laughs> I, I used to grow lavender down by the roadside, like the regular, you know, Hidcote and Munstead and, and, and mm-hmm. all those. And um, they used to get, uh, you know, the, the spray from the snow plow. So mm-hmm. in spring, all of the plants would be leaning this way. <laughs> you know, and then they would start growing again from that point, you know, and then they would, so they, they had sort of like a, a stair step approach or look after, after a couple of years. Um, and they just, they were not happy, you know, yeah, that all, 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 the, all the leaves stuck in there over, over winter and try getting those leaves out. It was just, it was a pain a in the nightmare. neck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But with, the, with these smaller guys, it's not much of an issue, you know? Right. You could just yeah. probably rake right around them or leaf blow out. They're manageable. Uh, they are, yeah. It, it's like the difference between a, a full-grown tiger and a tiger cub. You've been on Netflix recently, haven't you? It hasn't everybody? <laughs> so, all right, I'm gonna point out a plant that I had never thought about massing before. Um, I went to go visit a garden, I guess, two years ago out in Wisconsin. I was scouting it. We recently featured it in Fine Gardening Magazine. I think it was issue 193, maybe. Um, oh, and look, look at you dropping issue numbers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it was about a, a private garden that's out in Wisconsin and uh, called Afterglow Farms. And the whole article was all on massing. So, you know, uh, listeners, I highly recommend looking into that article because it had basically the most untraditional plants you would think of used in masses things now, like le- oh go ahead well i was gonna do uh alley and millennium ah, yeah. but i figured like no danielle's gonna take that you know i got the idea from from looking at that article of hers it would be unfair of me to steal it because i'm gonna for be not i'm gonna be the first one in with my plants um <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for not. And I knew that you left me that space to mention actually an allium because this garden in Wisconsin did. It had huge swaths. And I actually think theirs was uh, the allium that they used with Summer Beauty, but basically same thing, a dwarf ornamental, you know, allium. So I picked serendipity because I think it was last year, maybe it was the year before we were sent um, some new plants from Walter's Gardens to try out. And nobody wanted to take these allium plants because they didn't look like much of anything early in the spring. Just these little, you know, green sprouts and it was filling half the pot. It didn't really look like much. So I chucked those in on my hillside, full sun, well-drained, awful soil. And these things in just a year, I guess, two years, have massed out beautifully. And they have definitely made, I think I got three, I might have gotten five. They filled in beautifully. And they really have made this awesome mass. Um, that that foliage kind of looks like an ornamental grass, you know, when it's not blooming. Um, they popped into bloom. Now this is serendipity is the is the cultivar name. Zones four to eight too. So this has got a wide range. Um, popped into bloom maybe late May, early June. And those blooms kept coming, you know, kind of sporadically got covered with pollinators. The bees went nuts for these little purple lavender drumstick flowers. Um, and then Wait, which are which are they? <laughs> it is lavender color. I would say they're lavender kind of m- almost morphing into the pink range. Um, and then, you know, they went by, but the seed heads were really cool. I cut down the seed heads because I was like, oh, these are neat. I'll bring them inside just for something fun. And that forced it back into bloom in about August. And I only got maybe three or four blooms on each plant after that. So I wouldn't call it a re-bloomer. But that was a really fun and unexpected twist to this plant I wasn't expecting. Um, And this one stays relatively small. You know, there's a lot of ornamental onions, alliums out there that get really big. But this is 15 inches tall and wide, so it makes these nice clumps. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. I'm going to get more this year. I don't really see a discernible difference between Serendipity, which is the one I'm talking about and planted, Millennium, Summer Beauty. There's a little bit of size difference with all of these, but they're all like within two or three inches of each other. So definitely a worthwhile mass plant. There, there has to be, uh, and I don't know the name for it, and I, I want to find this out. There has to be a name for the alliums like Millennium, Serendipity, Summer Peekaboo, 
you know, these ones that, uh, blue curls, um, mm-hmm. these ones that, um, as opposed to the ones that are, come in the big bulbs and they send yeah. up some foliage early in the year and then the foliage dies back and then they send up a big cool bloom and then that's done. Yeah. But these, these are ones that have a presence basically all year round and they, they have yeah. cool looking foliage. Um, I think they're considered summer blooming alliums and, and okay. that's, but it's, those are, are awesome. So the one, you know, serendipity, um, mm-hmm. millennium, uh, like I said, blue curls we have down in the, the fine gardening test garden, uh, which is awesome. And they're great because they have this the really cool grassy foliage mm-hmm. um, all throughout the year. And then they send up long lasting flowers in the pink to lavender slash purple range. Mm-hmm. Um, just just great, great plants. And again, uh, low care. Mm-hmm. Uh, the deer don't eat them. I'm going to guess that the voles stay away from them. Yeah, actually. And you know what? I was just looking down that. Yeah, I've got these planted in an area where the voles have eaten um, a dwarf lady's mantle. They've eaten my ajuga and they've also snacked on some sedums that I've had in the area, but they haven't touched any of the alliums. So these are, dare I say, vole proof. Now, the second I said that, I'm probably going to go outside and they're going to be bugs bunnying them through the hole. But yeah, seem to be vole proof. Yeah, I have I have some alliums. Um, they're they're a species that they're like this. They're they're summer blooming and they have you know really nice foliage. And I got them um, from a nursery. I went to a fall sale at a nursery, and any with any purchase, you got to to take some of these alliums home with you. Um, they're giving them away like zucchini, you know, like oh, oh God, take some, just take some. You have a neighbor here, take some. Um, and I shoved them in the ground. Uh, and last year was their first year. You know, growing and they they grew and I forgot their name like like immediately once I left the parking lot oh. I totally forgot their name, and I said once they once they bloom I'll know their name, and they they bloomed last year I'm like oh those are great I should look up what their name is and I still haven't found what their name is but I can see them right outside the window they look great, um, again the voles went around them and ate several other things, uh, yeah. but they're they're still looking they're still looking awesome so uh, you know alliums they're just they're great for massing because of that foliage so when they're mm-hmm. not in bloom they they look cool. Um, and when they are in bloom, they look uh, awesome, but it's, again, it's not in your face beauty. So I want to go back to the shade for a minute because I was, uh, I was in a private garden and I saw a mass of, it had to be like a good eight plants uh, of, of this particular plant. And I said, Ooh, I totally have to do that. That's awesome. What is that? What is that plant? Um, of course I didn't take any pictures of it cause it was bright sun, um, but uh, it, it's something I absolutely have to copy. Uh, and this is a uh, Bertram Anderson pulmonaria. So oh, pulmonar- yeah. Yeah, pulmonaria, uh, pulmonaria uh, longifolia is the species. So it has long, uh, narrow foliage, um, blade-like. Lungwort. Yes, lung, uh, lung, lungwort. Um, so named because it has the mottled leaves. Mm-hmm. And th- be- because it looked like a diseased lung, mm-hmm. they thought that that plant then cured diseased lungs. Surprise! It that, doesn't. That's yeah. <laughs> um, about as much uh, about as uh, smart of an idea as uh, as uh, ingesting Lysol um, to get rid of, you know, <laughs> anything. Um, Too so. So here, so here's this 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 uh, Bertram Anderson has mottled leaves. So it has long green leaves with with splotches of of um, of white or gray or pewter, like whatever mm-hmm. you want to call them. Definitely not purple or lavender. <laughs> um, but, but these, these, these spotty leaves and it's a small, small thing, 10 to 12 inch, uh, tall tops. Um, you know, it gets to be about two feet wide. So it, it has this, this wonderful foliage. It looks great in the shade because this is a partial shade to full shade, uh, plant. It looks great, you know, as a mass, but even before, like right when that foliage is just getting going, it sends up these, these wonderful cobalt blue, uh, flowers, um, in, in like, you know, April, May. And it's just, it, it, that looks amazing. Um, so again, to, to, to be able to have a mass in shade, to add some brightness to it, um, really picks everything up. Um, this is, this plant got, um, four stars from the Chicago Botanic Garden in mm-hmm. their pulmonary trial. So it's a good one. Uh, it's been around for a while. So it's not one of those cultivars that is like the hip young, thing that is great now but then turns out to really stink in a few years it's it's been around a while and i think um they have used it to breed other newer cultivars so yeah. it's it, it, it's an oldie but a goodie uh, and it just looks amazing masked in shade and i totally want to do that 
uh, if only I have the right amount of moisture. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, it needs moist soil. All the good plants need moist shade. I know. There, there's no amazing plant that needs no sun and no water. That that, that plant does not <laughs> exist. You know. Well, dry shade, right? It's known as the worst gardening condition you can right? have. Yeah, and, and any plant shade. that that will that will grow in dry shade would really prefer, you know, yeah. moist shade. You know, exactly. Um, it I usually says me. tolerates yeah. dry shade. It's, you know, you know, people people do live in Alaska, you know, and in the <laughs> Arctic Circle. But really, they would probably prefer someplace a little warmer, you know. Hey, now, hey, now, you know, don't start uh, isolating our poor listeners in Fairbanks, Alaska. No, but I'm just saying, like, yeah. it, it had, had they had their, their – they probably like it a little chilly. But, hey, you know, <laughs> a little bit of warmer weather once every now and then would be would be nice, you know. You, re you realize that's what Californians say about where we live, right? They're like, who the hell would ever live in Connecticut? Right. Well <laughs> – now that it's like and, 45 and, degrees right and, now, and, we're going and, into May. And then and then everybody says that about Florida. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. My favorite thing about lungworts is, yes, they get that cobalt blue flower. But I think I talked about this with um, a variety, Twinkle Toes, that I had talked about on a previous episode. You just had to say it again. I love that name. But yeah, the the cool thing about lungworts is it does get that like cobalt blue flower, but then as the flower fades, it turns purple, then pink, then almost kind of like a like a a whitish color before it falls off. And on the plant, you have all these different various color blooms. So sometimes it looks like it blooms white, pink, purple, and blue all at the same time. It's really pretty. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I like that variation that they have as well. So, yeah. Okay. I'll give you a half point for that one too. <laughs> so didn't I get a half point for all of them? Yeah. So you're up to two points for those and keeping score at home. And so far, you have awarded yourself zero points. So no, I have been awarded three solid points. I got a solid point for each one of my plants. And ready? I'm going to hit my fourth full point right now. And right. I'm staying. I'm staying in the shade too. Um, this is a plant I mentioned before. I love this plant. It reminds me every spring when I go out in my garden how much I love it. It's European wild ginger. It's a serum uh, europium. I love this ginger. I know that there are native ones. I know that everybody's going to write in and be like, what about the native? But the thing that I like about the European form of the wild ginger is how shiny the leaves are. I mean, these look like bright Cali green, shiny lily pads on the ground. And about, I don't know, six years ago, I planted a mass of these in the small little area shade garden that I have. Um, they were teeny tiny, I think three inch pots of these. I speckled them out and I now have this luxurious carpeted mat of European ginger and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, when it's not a snowy winter, they actually stay evergreen all throughout the rest of the year, um, the, through the winter rather. And then in spring, they kind of clean themselves up. The, the old leaves die down and the new ones push through. And I don't even think I even really rake those old leaves out. They kind of just decompose in place. I don't know. Maybe you're supposed to clean them out. I don't. Um, but this is just an awesome, awesome plant. And speaking of something that will tolerate a little bit of dry shade, they prefer moist conditions, soil conditions, full shade. But I have it actually at the base of a, a larger shrub. So it's really a dry area and um, it's it's doing gangbusters. Love this plant. Beautiful, beautiful massing. Foliage plant. You know, you're not going to get any crazy awesome flowers off of it, but super dividable as well. I took some chunks of this out, um, I guess, last year of my mass and gave it away to a friend who was doing a garden. And yeah, and it didn't skip a beat, filled right back in again. So this is a this is a favorite. Yeah, I've uh, I planted some in in, uh, in dry shade. I think I planted three. Uh, two died, but one lived. And then okay, I, planted, I planted another one in there. And so now I've got two in dry shade. And then I planted a whole bunch in, a, in an area that's a little bit um, moister. Okay. And um, this is their first year coming back. And uh, I'm, I'm excited because they're one of the few things that, that came back for me. I've just uh, seen a devastation in my garden. Thank you, voles <laughs> and deer <laughs> and late frost. Uh, but they're one of the few things that come back. And yeah, they're, you know, 
the natives are great, but the thing about natives versus exotics is that the exotics are always um, better looking, you know, showier. Right. I mean, in this case, it's it's a showier plant because of that ultra shiny leaf, which is just stunning, absolutely yeah, and, stunning, and, and and a tighter habit. The the native is a yeah. little bit looser, you know. Yeah, um, still still a great plant. Um, yeah, but the, the the native is just it's or the uh, the non native is just shinier. Um, yeah, I don't plants. think. Yeah. Did we? I don't think I mentioned the size on this guy. This guy is only four to six inches tall, and then masses yeah. out to about twelve to fourteen inches wide. Sometimes a little bit more. Um, and zones four to seven, so you know it goes it goes pretty low too, which is awesome. Do, do you ever bend down and look for the flowers? No, <laughs> I don't even know if it does. I, I mean, I know it flowers, but I, I don't even know if mine have ever flowered. They, there are some choice ones now that are being offered, like some really, really crazy ones by like Plant Delights Nursery, where the flowers look pretty cool. You know, burgundy kind of recurved back, almost mushroom like flowers to them. I don't yeah, know. But you, you know, you have to lie on the ground and then lift up the leaves, you know. Yeah. Right. And then get a mag- I'm going to get a magnifying glass to see it. So, <laughs> Which is exactly what I want to do in April when it's 45 right. degrees outside. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now, because everything sounds better with a British accent, here's Peter to talk about words. In case you couldn't tell, I am British. Setting Americans straight on things comes naturally to me. For example, tea should not come in a bag. Football is a game where the foot is in regular contact with the ball. And Shakespeare's words sound the way we say them, not the way you do. And when it comes to gardening, where our superiority is unquestioned, I'm always happy to correct your mistakes. One pet peeve of mine is when the words clump, grouping and mass are used interchangeably. These are separate words with different, albeit similar, meanings. This is even more irritating than people who consider purple and lavender to be the same colour. A clump is one plant that's slowly expanded, maybe through suckers. While there might be distinct plants within the clump, they were all, at some point, connected to the mother plant. A grouping, on the other hand, is several different plants, all in one area, making a collective whole. A grouping of dwarf conifers, for example. One may have a grouping of daylilies, say, but they must all be different cultivars. A mass is at least five of the same plant, planted together, but arranged to take up space. What do I call fewer than five of the same plant in the same area? First, I don't recall inviting questions. Second, this would obviously be a planting. I wish I had the time to answer more of your gardening questions or to teach you how to be simultaneously charming and condescending. But I hear music, which, like words, has meaning. So until next time, stay safe and stay gardening. And there's nobody like Peter to make uh, something that's mildly insulting sound wonderful. Yeah, and speaking of condescending, I know somebody who's like that as well. Wonder who that could be, Steve. Hi, I'm Austin Eyshide, principal and lead designer at Austin Eyshide Garden Design based in Chicago, Illinois. We create sustainable, ecological, and four-season interest naturalistic gardens all around the United States for residential, commercial, or public space. I'm here to tell you about some of my favorite perennials that I love to use in massing in my garden designs. And my first favorite, all-time favorite, I believe, is Calamantha nepeta subspecies nepeta, and also called, common name is Calamint. This does well in zones five to seven, gets about 18 inches tall and by two to three foot wide. And this does really well in full sun, dry to medium soil, well-drained. It's a pollinator magnet. It's always flying with activity, and it's one of my favorite plants to use along a border, along the edge, because it just looks like clouds as it's billowing over the edge and creating that natural form. And this plant blooms from late June until frost, which is incredible. And as the flowers progress throughout the season, Uh, A lot of people say it's a pale blue, but it starts out white. And then as the season gets cooler into fall, the the blue really stands out more. And the fall color is stunning as it turns to purple. And then once it hits winter, then you have the beautiful 
espresso foliage that stays all winter long and you get to enjoy it with a dusting of snow on top. My third favorite is Pycnanthema muticum, also known as mountain mint. Does well in zones four to eight, gets three foot tall by three foot wide, dry to medium soil, and flowers from July till September. It has these stunning, beautiful silver bracts, which are the leaves towards the top of the plant, and it just looks like it's in flower from July till frost about. And then this is probably one of the busiest pollinator plants in my garden. It is stunning to watch and it's full of entertainment, seeing all the butterflies and bees and all the action happening. So it's a great one to have by the patio. And because of its size, I like to use it more of a focal point plant dotted throughout the garden. And it really draws your eye through a space because of the long seasonal interest. And this makes for a great mast plant because it's rhizominous. So that meaning that it grows with rhizomes and gets bigger every year. And so if you find that it's the right size, then in the spring you can go around with a spade and make sure that it doesn't get too far out of bounds and creep into the next door neighbor's allotted space. But it's definitely a must have in any pollinator lover's garden. My fourth favorite perennial for massing is Aster macrophyllus cultivar twilight, big leaf aster. This does well in zones three to nine, does well from dry to moist soil, two and a half foot tall by three foot and full sun to part shade, which this means this is a great plant to add in many areas of the garden. So if you want to do that repetition and you have a little bit part sun areas and full sun and then maybe a wet spot in another area, this is a really good one that will do well in all of those different cultural requirements. So like I said, full sun and it's got these beautiful purple flowers on them from August till September. And this one is also rhizominous, so it creates a nice colony and so it makes for a nice uh, plant to add, you know, three, five, seven, depending on how large of planting you're doing. And it's got these beautiful dark purple stems on it that are showy all summer long and into fall. And then the seed heads are one of my favorite things. And once the flowers are gone all winter long, it has these beautiful kind of straw-like star-shaped flowers se or seed heads. And the winter sun shines on them and it just glows in the garden and it looks beautiful and and keeps its structure all winter long so it's a great plant to keep some structure in the winter to enjoy in those dreary winter days and my fifth favorite perennial for massing is epimedium rubrum red barrenwort this does well in zones five to nine gets about a foot tall to a foot and a half wide and I thought I would throw in a shade perennial for everybody, and this is one of my favorites, and does well in part shade to full shade. It blooms in April to May with these soft pink, delicate little starbursts that um, float above the new foliage that is coming up. And then as the foliage expands and gets bigger, it kind of turns to this beautiful, soft, fresh spring green color, and then as they get larger and go over the flowers, they get these beautiful red, rich blush veins all over the leaf, creating this mottled pattern. And it's really, really stunning with all of your other textures in the shade garden. And this is a one that loves dry to medium soil. And if you have any of those shade trees that you're finding a hard to grow turf over or any other perennials, this is a really good one that can compete once it's established. And this also has a beautiful red fall color, a must try. You know, every time we have an expert on, I feel like I know less and less about gardening because what they say makes so much sense. And I, I you know, people keep I, asking us for advice. Why? <laughs> I, I, I agree. You don't make a lot of sense when you talk about gardening. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Well, you know what? This would normally be when we wrap up the episode, but we have some listener mail. So let's dip in and see what our listener mail is all about. 
Hello, my name is Elizabeth and I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. My husband and I are building a new home and we'll be starting a garden from scratch as all the topsoil has been removed and the land is currently just weeds and rocks on a very alkaline soil. Part of my vision is to have an embankment of lightly cultivated meadow or prairie space with short native grasses and native flowering perennials. Would you advise me on how to best start and manage this space? I'm unsure how to keep these previously growing weeds from taking over. Would you start from seed or start from plugs? I would greatly appreciate your advice. Hi, Elizabeth. This is Chris Schlinker, head gardener at Macquarie Gardens, a 70-acre botanical garden in Brookings, South Dakota, and Fine Gardening's regional reporter for the Northern Plains. I love what you have in mind, and I've got some suggestions for you to make your vision come to life. Since you are starting with a new construction site, there are a couple things you'll want to have done to the entire site to provide a healthy base to work with. Namely, prior to having your topsoil replaced, you'll want to make sure that the current terrain is scarified, uh, which can be done through tilling, disking, or plowing. Oftentimes, after construction, topsoil is placed on top of compacted, heavy clay soils, which creates a hard pan, preventing water from percolating and draining well from the site. By scarifying the site, you're going to break up that dense soil layer and begin to repair those natural soil layers that Mother Nature has spent thousands of years creating to allow better drainage uh, and allow the eventual native plants to more easily send their deep roots into the ground. Once you have that completed, you can reintroduce the topsoil, hopefully from the site itself or at least a local source, ensuring that there hopefully won't be any new-to-you or your neighbor weeds or pests. With topsoil, the more the merrier, but a good target would be 8 inches of beautiful dark topsoil. If you feel that it is still a bit too heavy in clay, consider adding a layer of organic matter and having it tilled in. In regards to the rocks that you may be encountering in your topsoil, hand picking is probably the most efficient method for removal. Weed control will hopefully be taken care of through the mechanical means of uh, the site prep process. Uh, however, the first step in weed control is really identifying your enemy. Uh, as the method of control will be dictated by the weed type, so if it's a noxious weed like Canada thistle, field bindweed, or any host of others, persistent chemical control for several years will have to be used to really remove that pest. Other weeds such as dandelions and the like, you know, there's several different methods for control to explore to get rid of those. And now that you have a base, you can look at establishing a native prairie garden. And not to intimidate you, but rather to prepare you, it is going to take some patience and a good amount of special attention to recreate a slice of what took thousands of years to establish and balance out. But do not fear, it can be done, and the results are really, really worth the effort. Now first you're going to want to measure out the space that you want to plant and then choose a native seed mix uh, and recommended quantity to broadcast spread. Depending on your site's Sun, soil conditions, and personal preference, this can range from mixes with equal balances of grasses and wildflowers, or a bit heavier on either end. Millbourne Seeds, located 50 miles north of Sioux Falls, right here in Brookings, are experts in the native seed blends for our area. Prairie Moon Nursery, located in Winona, Minnesota, is another great source of native seed mixes to get started with. Prior to broadcast spreading, begin with a lightly compacted ground and avoid tilling prior to sowing. Timing of the seeding is also important. Fall or frost plantings are preferred as the native seeds will germinate according to their natural rhythm in the spring. However, early spring planting is a viable option as well. During that first growing season, depending on the size of the space, most sites will need some maintenance mowings to prevent weeds from going to seed and allow light to penetrate down to the slow growing natives. If your space is small enough and you feel comfortable identifying seedlings, hand weeding is also an option. However, you want to be careful not to disrupt the roots of establishing seedlings as much as possible. Depending on the seed blend, you may see some blooms that first season for manuals such as Mexican Hat, Partridge Pea, or Black-Eyed Susan. But these will diminish over time as other species become more established. For additional pops of color, and depending on what type of plants you really want to see in your garden, consider adding plugs or potted native perennials from your local nursery. They can be strategically placed or randomized to create a more natural look in your garden. After that first growing season, as soon as that snow melts in the following spring, you'll want to do what we call kind of a mock burn and mow down the entire site to nearly the lowest setting that you can, and then remove as much of that material as possible. Since you aren't all able to do a prescribed burn to our native stands, this is probably the next best thing. By removing that old plant material, we promote the germination of native seeds, encouraging growth of our wanted plants, and discourage weeds from budding in. By that second and third growing season, you will really start to enjoy the fruits of your labor, and you'll be the envy of the neighborhood.
And that sounds like great advice, Danielle. I have no idea what it's like to to garden in either of the Dakotas. I know. I I don't even know if I could find the Dakotas on a map. No, no, no. They're one of the square ones, right? One of the square ones. They're rectangular. Yeah. Square, rectangle, you know. Well, maybe we should start there with your learning. Then we'll work up to geography. And then maybe gardening. <laughs> <laughs>